So welcome everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Depending on where you are. Welcome to this tutorial on psychology informed recommender systems. Great to see you. We are so Elizabeth and I are somewhat envious, I would say. We couldn't be in Seattle, unfortunately, but to see you, you're already enjoying the conference. So a warm welcome from Austria on our side. Uh, yeah, you're in tutorial on psychology and fund recommender systems, and this will be given by Elizabeth Lex and by myself. My name is Markus Schädel. Uh, I'm actually a professor at Johannes Kepler University in Linz in Austria, and also affiliated with the Linz Institute of Technology, where I lead the human center, the I group, and also the multimedia mining and search group. And yeah, Elizabeth, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. So I'm very excited to give this tutorial to this community. It's unfortunate that we cannot be in person at Rexis, but I hope you have a great time. So I'm an associate professor also in Austria in Graz University of Technology. Um, I work in the Institute of Interactive Systems and Data Science, where I'm heading a lab on with a focus on recommender systems and social computing. And if you have any questions afterwards also, then please just drop drop me or Marcus a line. We're happy yeah, to some, talk about today's topic. Follow us on Twitter or yeah, whatever you like. Whatever you like. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. So um, yeah, first to say that uh, this tutorial is accompanied by a recent survey article that we published in the Foundations and Trends in Information Retrieval Journal, which is, well, not very creatively named, well, according to the very same title, Psychology and Fund Recommender Systems. And it comes with a preprint, which you can download here from this URL if you want, and you will find much, much more information, much more details uh, than we are capable to, uh, to talk about today in this article. So if you really want to dig deep, then please uh, yeah, read the article and you can, as Liz already said, always reach out to us. So what are we going to talk about today? So uh, we organized this tutorial into four parts. We first want to give a short introduction, uh, yeah, tell you a little bit about the motivation, why psychology and recommender systems should go together. Then in the major part, in the second part, we'll uh, talk about three different kinds of psychology informed recommender systems, so basically uh, recommender system approaches that consider certain cognitive architectures or cognitive uh, models in the recommendation process. And then we'll talk about how to integrate personality information into the recommendation process and also about how to integrate effective cues such as mood and emotions into recommender systems. Uh, then Liz will continue with some ideas about user-centric evaluation and how it connects to certain aspects from psychology. And then we'll actually end the tutorial by giving you a quick uh, yeah, outline about what we believe are the major, the grand challenges in this specific uh, yeah, subfield of psychology informed recommender systems. Yeah. Let's directly uh, start with this. Probably, I mean, since we all have a recommender systems background, I don't need to give you much of detail here. So we all know that or the, the basic flavors of recommender systems or categories can be our, co our collaborative filtering, where basically users are matched based on uh, the similarity of items they consumed in the past. We have content-based filtering that actually recommend to our target user item or content that is similar according to some content specific features like genre or you know, musical instruments, whatever. And then we have context aware recommender systems that actually consider the context or the environment of the user item interaction in the recommendation process. And hybrid recommender systems combine different aspects of the aforementioned one. Just to see where we position uh, psychology informed recommender systems. And we'll see that most approaches kind of can be categorized into context aware recommender systems, where psychology just represents another 
context factor either on the user side or on the item side. And often you also find hybrid combinations. So using psychology, psychological constructs or psychological information about the user to extend the collaborative filtering approach. But we'll give you way more examples later on in the tutorial. So you, you want to continue, Elizabeth? Yeah, I can if you let me share the screen. <laughs> and I'm happy to share my screen. And go on. I hope you can see the slides. So now, it, um, as you are aware, our tutorial is called Psychology Informed Recommender Systems. So the question is really, so it's the field of recommender systems has been such a, oh, an amazing, it. yeah. So, sorry. sorry, I cannot see this. I can't slide. see your screen, oh. Elizabeth. Ah, okay, thank you. Yet, yeah. does it not work? No. Okay it does not give me any kind of otherwise i can just continue sharing yeah maybe you share yeah i don't know what here. happened please uh -huh. stop sharing because i can't share <laughs> as long as you Sorry. stop share yeah i don't know what happened yes okay good okay, okay. thank you marcus yeah, so I mean, in our field, I think in the past 10 years or 15 years, so there have been amazing machine learning based um, innovations, of course, in the, to come up with new recommender systems to develop new algorithms. But in the end, early work in recommender systems is really very much motivated by observations that that psychologists sit up. Um, factors you uh, Marcus, did you have a problem? Can you hear it? Could you hear Elizabeth? Yes, yes. I yeah, so I, I got kicked out. I think I was, <laughs> I was kicked out. <laughs> Sorry about this. Yeah, so let's continue. So early work in recommender systems is, is very much pretty much motivated by how people make their decisions, because in the end, so a lot of people in the field of psychology found that when we um, may want to make a decision on what we want to buy or what kind of movie we want to consume, what kind of piece of music we want to listen to, or what concert we go to, to we tend to go to our peers to our similarly others to our trusted connections so um, we base our decisions on the recommendations of other people and the early especially the early work in the field of recommender systems really aim to mimic that kind of human behavior and it also mimicked like how emotions impact human decision making what kind of processes shape our attention um, then insights from research on what makes users satisfied with, uh, for instance, a user interface really like went on into early work and recommender systems research. And of course, a whole rich body of how human decision making takes place in general is kind of a strong influence for the field of recommender systems. But then, I mean, so kind of machine learning took over and we have now all, of course, these nice amounts of data behavioral traces and we can do all sorts of predictive modeling and designing of cool algorithms exploiting this kind of data but in the end um, we are now at the very very we have the great opportunity now that we can now take this behavioral data and combine it with psychological insights psychological models that tell us why humans uh, make their decisions in order to improve the recommendation process and this is kind of the motivation of of, of this whole field of why it's useful to take in psychology into the like a factor of designing and improving recommendation algorithms and models Um, we have uh, reviewed the state of the art in recommender systems in a large survey art article that Marcus has shown you in the beginning. And we categorized 
um, the work that exists where people try to combine psychological findings with uh, recommendation algorithms into um, the following taxonomy. So we categorized work into cognition inspired recommender systems, personality aware recommender systems and effect aware recommender systems. As the names kind of imply in cognition inspired recommender systems, the idea is really to take insights from the field of cognitive science, which is an interdisciplinary field by itself, uh, where uh, psychologists, neurologists, and also computer scientists work together to understand human cognition, like how human thinking works, how language is formed and so forth. And in personality aware, the idea is um, to take into account personality traits, personality factors into that personalization. And we know from, from many studies that um, pe people with different personality traits have different preferences. And Marcus will present you interesting papers that, that show how we can exploit personality information in the recommendation process. And as a third category, um, there is effect-aware recommender systems. And here um, we also know that yeah, our emotions and our mood shape prefer uh, preferences, especially in, 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 in domains such as entertainment, we can see this a lot. So music is very, very frequently used in order to regularize, regularize our mood. And here in this part, um, we can also exploit this information, of course, in, about a person's current mood to do um, further personalization or to solve critical problems such as the cold start problem. And these tax, this taxonomy, you will find this in our paper and you'll find this also kind of as a guide and guiding theme through our tutorial. So we'll start with the first part, so cognition inspired recommender systems. And first of all, I would give you an introduction. So what is cognition? So what is what is commonly studied there? What are important cognitive processes? And then um, I will show you examples for cognition inspired models for recommender systems. That means so there are cognitive models that are used directly in the recommendation model or in the evaluation of the recommendation system. Um, there are many, many cognitive models, of course, because our human cognition is really complex. But in the in the field of recommender systems, uh, works have um, implemented stereotypes um, as a way to incorporate cognitive inspired models into recommendations. Or memory effects play a huge role uh, in shaping human preferences. Then uh, in our paper, we describe case-based reasoning, reasoning as a form of cognition-inspired recommender system. And I would assume many in, our, in here in this room and in, in the Zoom room, yeah, you know that this is a, a separate kind of recommender systems. So it could be a, a category on their own, but they are heavily inspired by psychological findings. Then there's attention, which is an important mechanism that shapes um, what kind of items we select. And in our paper, we also describe competence as a form of cognition inspired recommender systems, so competence based recommender systems, which are very much uh, used in, in learning domains. So, for instance, in an e learning context. Um, but um, in the interest of time, so I will now show you examples from stereotypes, memory and attention, and I invite you to, to check out um, the, our paper to have an overview of the other categories as well. But let's start, let's start with an introduction. So cognition inspired recommender systems. So what are they? The idea is here to, to incorporate um, theories and models from cognition, from human cognition into the recommendation process. And this can happen in many st in various stages. So we can use cognitive models to model user behavior or to predict user behavior and to design recommender systems, or we can use it to improve existing systems. So like, like take some, some standard collaborative filtering, for instance, and then improve it based on on one cognitive process such as attention. 
for instance. So what is cognition now? I'm not sure if you are aware of this term. So this is a huge field in, in the domain of psychology. And the idea is to study in cognition how our human mind works. So as cognition, psychologists define as um, cognition being like the accumulation of knowledge that that humans gain from learning and experiencing their surroundings. Another definition is that cognition corresponds to the, the capability of processing information in our brain. And this information is acquired through perception. So that means um, seeing, hearing, and so forth. And like I said, so this is a, a domain, uh, a topic that is studied in many domains. So not only in psychology, but of course, heavily in psychology. And on the right side of this slide, you see um, fundamental cognitive processes. So those are parts of human cognition or parts that, that make human cognition more or less happening. And you can see that memory is an important cognitive process, attention, problem solving, reasoning, and, and everything that you see like on the left side of, of this image should ring a bell um, because all these these terms are more or less also topics that we that we <laughs> study in computer science so we we have memory systems attention is a mechanism that is now especially used in this deep learning in the field of deep learning or um, an important topic in the field of deep learning reasoning, um, this kind of symbolic AI is something that now has really a search, problem solving, decision making. This is the, all those are processes that we also would like to, to support with recommender systems. And from these topics, you see that this cognition is a heavily, <laughs> a heavy topic. And how does this now link to our recommender systems? problems and uh, recommender systems field. So what cognitive scientists aim to do when they study human cognition is they want to understand how the human mind works. They want to understand, they want to specifically describe and predict the behavior of people and they want to explain it. An example would be if you um, like forget a person's name. So you meet somebody, maybe at Rexis, and then you forget the person's name. And then a classic research question in cognitive science would be, what cognitive process is responsible that you have forgotten the name of the person that you have just met? Would it be your memory that is responsible for this forgetting process? Or would it be the attention? Maybe you did not pay that much of an attention to the name of the person. So this is not, not, not something that is where there's a clear answer. And this is why this is, uh, so, so those would be research questions. And the way they're doing it is they typically employ a computational approach to understand, to researching such questions. That means, so they're doing experiments, they're collecting, they, they of course, user experiments, they, they collect behavioral data about um, user user's behavior in a in a specific scenario. And then they come up with really nice mathematical models, statistically probabili probabilistic models about these cognitive processes. So this is really nice <laughs> um, because that makes it very much applicable to a computer scientist. Um, because in in a in, in, in great scenarios, in some, in some models, we can even take these mathematical formulations that come from the field of cognitive science and create algorithms out of that in order to predict or to model and predict behavior. And I will show you some examples of how to do that. And I think what, what the great synergy between uh, psychology and recommender systems in this case is not only that we as computer scientists, we can take cognitive models in order to come up with new algorithms, but also um, like vice versa, um, we can take like the findings that our or the results that our algorithms produce in order to test the psychological theories in order to interpret these behavioral traces that we collect by people and see what kind of cognitive theory applies and if the theory um, 
even maybe needs an update and so forth. So this is kind of uh, uh, an, adv uh, uh, an advantage for both communities. So not only for, for us as a computer science community. Yeah, so in cognition inspired models for recommender systems. So we, um, we found um, subcategories more or less. So I, I mentioned them before. So there are stereotypes, which are a very simple um, cognitive model of, of human decision-making. Human memory plays a huge role and we can exploit memory models very nicely to predict user behavior. Um, attention is an important process. Yeah, I think I covered this already. So I think we can go over this slide. Thank you. And now I would like to show you already um, the first cognition inspired recommender system, more or less, um, which is the Grundy system. And the Grundy system is recognized more or less, I think, by many in our community as the first recommender systems. And it was a, a book recommender system, which was invented or proposed in 1979, so quite a while ago, um, by Elaine Bridge. And interestingly enough, so Elaine Bridge was a computer scientist, but the Grundy system was published in a, in a cognitive science journal. So you could see like the, the link between those community very nicely. And the idea was to mimic um, like a librarian. So to come up with a book recommender system, recommendation system that recommends people books they would like to read or that would fit their, their preferences. And the underlying premise of this recommendation algorithm was that the people um, who these recommendations were produced for, they have were organized and categorized according to stereotypes. And stereotyping is a mechanism that we as humans apply quite frequently. It's a cognitive heuristic, so it's a mental shortcut more or less. So it eases uh, the complexity of decision making in many cases. And uh, what we can we can see stereotypes as being clusters of characteristics. So it's a collection of characteristics that frequently occur within a group of users. And of course, stereotypes. Yeah, I mean, it could also be seen as something negative. So because it's a simplification, but it's really useful in many cases because it helps us reduce complexity, because it helps us introducing categorizations in our in our decision making. Um, could you go to the next slide, Marcus, please? Thank you. So what the Grundy system had, it had it, it featured two types of information. So we had the stereotypes, which was a collection of these common characteristics or, tra or traits of groups of people. And then there is a collection of triggers and triggers are events that, yeah, that trigger if a specific stereotype should be applied or could be applied. And you can see this um, here on the right side. So there are some samples, um, sample triggers. And so you have a person um, who likes to, to read a lot, who, the, who, does, who belongs to the stereotype of being non, a non-TV person, so an educated person, and you would recommend them a more um, complex, sophisticated type of literature based on this stereotype. While stereotypes are, of course, very simplistic, um, the advantage is really that they are transparent. And I think when we, as a community, we now talk a lot about transparency in, uh, in understanding why recommendations are produced. So this is an advantage. And because of their simplicity, um, they are of course not extremely accurate. So in real in real life, they are very frequently complemented with other recommendation system approaches um, because they help, of course, in 
cold start scenarios and so forth. And while they have been introduced in the field for such a long time ago, so they even used in, in papers from 2021. Um, so they are still up to date. Um, the next cognitive process that I would like to go into in a little bit more detail is memory as a cognitive process. Memory is a really fundamental cognitive process because it helps us interact with our physical and social environment. So if our memory is impaired, we really have an issue and um, interacting with, with our surroundings. Um, with memory, we, we need memory in order to do problem solving because we need to recall information that we need in order to solve a problem. We need memory in order to like direct our attention for decision making. And it also, of course, has a central role in our perception because, of course, our sensory registers um, so we sense a lot of information, but in the end, um, we cannot memorize everything. And this is where the attention and memory really are fundamental in order to, to help us collect our thoughts. Um, typically, memory is organized in several submodules, which are also called memory structures. So we have a sensory memory, and this is where like all the the sensory information from our surroundings are registered and collected. Then we have a short-term memory, and then we have a long-term memory. And while these memory structures are you know, agreed upon, in the, in the end, there are many models of, of memory available. So also in the field of psychology, there are many, many models. Um, so for instance, here on the right side of this slide, you see the atkinson shiftgren model. Um, and I put this here because it's one is a frequently used one, and you can see you can see exactly these these models, uh, these memory structures. So you have a sensory memory, the short term memory, and the long term memory. Yeah. Um, in in uh, memory has several key functions, um, so that memory so that memory information or information can be drawn from the memory. Um, and those are encoding of information, storage of information and retriever of information. And I think you can see here encoding storage retriever. <laughs> you can already see again the link to the field of computer science because this is what we do with our data. So we acquire data, we encode it. Um, which means we record the information, um, we contextualize the information, which is also happening in our in our cognitive process memory. So their information is contextualized according to temporal and spatial context, and maybe also to other relevant contextual factors, such as emotion. Emotion is an important contextual factor. Um, with the advantage this, that this contextualization allows us then to retrieve information from the memory more efficiently. Then there's storage, storage where the coded information is then retained. That means stored over a period of time, depending on in what memory module. So if it's only in the short term memory, it's maybe like 10 minutes, I think 10 or 15 minutes and in the long term memory for a longer period of time and in retrieval. So it means that we can recover the stored information whenever we need it. So this is um, what how memory as an so be, bear in mind I'm a computer scientist so I'm not a psychologist so this is my computer science perspective on the on the cognitive process memory but now I can show you how we can exploit memory models and memory functionality uh, to model and predict user behavior. Uh, maybe before I do that, maybe I one quick note. So there are all sorts of interesting effects uh, with our memory. The way we recall information is also um, very interesting and very frequently also exploited <laughs> in, in, in online user interface designs, but also in recommender systems. 
so um there is this so-called serial positioning effect. Maybe you have heard about this, or maybe you, you are aware of this phenomenon, that whenever we show, we're show we showing a list of items, we tend to remember the first and the last item in the list much better than the ones in the middle. And this is also true in, in, a list, in lists of recommendations. This is true in lists of search results. So um, this is why you should have your best results like always at the beginning of, of your list or maybe at the end of your list because this is where people were going to look. And this effect, the serial positioning effect was detected by also another psychologist called Ebbinghaus, a German psychologist, in the 1880s. So it's a very, very long time ago. And he did this, of course, in the context of a, a small scale user experiment where um, he himself tried to memorize nonsensical syllables. And then he, re so he memorized them and then he tracked um, uh, the time decay of this mem so how well he could memorize this nonsensical uh, syllables after a period of time and he found exactly this behavior so the first and the last items were remembered much better than the ones in the middle and why am I, why am i telling you this because um and maybe just quickly so this effect so this memory effect can be described in the form of a function, of an exponential function. You can see this here where the memory retention R is given by uh, E um, to the power of the time elapsed divided by the relative strength of the memory, whereas the relative strength of the memory is, for instance, the exposure event to the item. And this follows an exponential decay function. Um, could you go one slide? And why am I showing you this? Because this memory effect, this curve from the 1880s can be very nicely used in order to account for interest shifts of users um, that happen over time, because we know that um, many of, of the algorithms work on rating data or on maybe on some implicit feedback that people gave to items at a specific point in time. And the standard collaborative filtering algorithm does not account for any kind of interest shift, shifts that happen. But of course, people change their preferences and interests over time. So in a normal setting, a time information about when the rating was, was produced is typically ignored. And then in, in a paper by Ren et al from 2015, they had an idea to, to model these user interest shifts as a form of forgetting information. And, and what they did is by exploiting this Ebbinghaus curve. So they said, so the longer ago a rating was provided, uh, the less likely it's going to be relevant for the user. So this was the underlying hypothesis. And this kind of decay of relevancy followed exactly this exponential decay weight that Ebbinghaus has um, described in the context of how information is retained in our memory. So what they did in this paper is so they, they uh, created such a time-based ex exponential decay weight based on the produced time of the ratings and used this as a weighting factor, factor in, um, so as an additional weight when the similarity computation and the rating prediction is done. And they found that by adding these psychological mechanisms from the 1880s, <laughs> yeah. uh, they could improve uh, the, the accuracy or they could improve the, the rating prediction of a compared to a standard uh, correlative filtering algorithm with this add-on. And I think this is really great. So a very old psychological theory <laughs> brought into, the, into new life um, to improve a recommend, an existing recommendation approach. Uh, by the way, so also like if you have questions, please also 
interrupt or put it put the questions in the chat. Um, so we're trying to monitor the chat as well. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Could you go on? Um, oh, sure. Thank you. So these kind of the cognitive models that I've mentioned now, they are typically organized in larger so-called cognitive architecture. So this by, by psycholo uh, psychologists, because the idea really of cognitive science is to come up or to have a unified perspective in the theory of the human mind. And these cognitive architectures, then memory would be just just one module in such an architecture, for instance. And they are these architectures um, make all sorts of theoretical assumptions about mechanisms underlying human decision making, about human cognition, and the, all of this is based on psychological findings from psychological experiments. Um, what's really nice is that typically for such cognitive architectures, also programmatic implementations are available, sometimes in exotic programming languages, I have to say, but <laughs> you, you can really see this computational uh, thinking in these kind of architectures. And I would like to show you uh, just a quick overview of how many architectures exist. You can see this on this on this graph on the right side. There are lots of names of cognitive architectures that apply to very different tasks from the fields of robotics to um, search or also to recommend the systems. And the one that I would like to introduce to you in a little bit more detail is the Cognitive Architecture Act R, which is short for Adaptive Control of Thought, because it's really a highly prominent architecture also in the context of recommender systems. And in our literature research, uh, we found uh, most papers using Act R. And I think there was just one, a few papers that used a different cognitive architecture as a basis to, to design algorithms. Act R, um, you can see here on the slides, I put here also um, a link to the project of Act R at CMU. So it comes, it was developed at CMU. Um, it has a, a great advantage compared to other cognitive architectures from my point of view, because it enables to directly compare quantitative measures ob obtained with human experiments, so with user studies, as well as with um, quantitative measures that are, yeah, like done um, from, or that are computed based on behavioral data. This is um, one art, one advantage and one one pro argument, I would say, for that. And like I said, so Act R or parts of Act R have been used a lot in the context of recommender systems, um, because spe specifically, I would say, specifically the part on human memory in Act R, um, because in the cognitive architecture Act R. Um, there are activation processes described in human memory. If you look at this, this image at the bottom of the slide, again, you can see, so there are, there are several memory structures. In this case, there is a sensory re register, which records like the, the sensory information that happens through the interaction with the context. Then there's the working memory which corresponds to a short-term memory. And then there is a declarative and procedural memory modules. On, and both of them uh, correspond to a long-term memory structure. And we would like to focus now on this declarative memory module in ECTAR. And there on a specific part of this declarative memory, namely this activation processes. And what are activation processes? In the end, um, in order to have an efficient retrieval of some information, 
it needs to be activated. It needs to have a higher act uh, activation um, compared to everything else so that we can do like an efficient retrieval. So um, there are all sorts of psychological mechanisms that increase the activation of something. So it could be like a particular emotion that triggers triggers um, a particular memory. Maybe you have experienced that or when you have heard a song that conveys a specific emotion and you get then a memory of, I don't know, I don't know, your mother or whatever, <laughs> something very emotional to you. And how this, and, and then this memory unit would have then a higher activation. And um, how does this work? So there is um, a so-called base level activation and an associative activation. And this base level activation and this, this associate activation, they give us how relevant a piece of information, a memory unit is for us in the current setting, in the current context. And this is described here in this, in this equation. So this AI uh, activation of a memory unit is the sum of BI, the space level activation, and this and this sum of uh, W and S, which is like this associative activation. So it's how relevant this is in the current context. And interestingly, um, typically information can be easier extracted from human memory or a memory unit is has a higher activation if it has been used frequently and recently. So then the activation is higher. And this um, is modeled in the base level learning activation, BI, um, in the form of a power time dependent power law uh, function. So you see this at the bottom of the slide you see this power law function. So the, the more recently and the more frequently an information unit has been used, the higher its activation, the higher its rele relevancy for you. This is how it works in our memory. How does this now, can we see this now in user behavior? Yeah, thank you. Next slide, yeah. Can we see this now in user behavior? And actually we can. I, sh I would like to show you an example from our own previous work, work that, that Marcus and I have been doing with co-authors, where we wanted, our original idea was to, uh, yeah, to see, to investigate popularity bias for consumers of low mainstream music. And we know of this problem with popularity bias. I think there are many works at this conference now <laughs> that are also looking into reasons for popularity bias or mitigation strategies. And this is what we wanted to do. And we wanted to see specifically, we wanted to specifically investigate this problem for people who are interested in niche content, because we know that for them popularity bias is even harder. And we realized that modeling such users is quite challenging because they are very, they, are, they behaved a little differently in our data, at least, compared to listeners of mainstream music. So uh, we did an experiment on a large data collection, of, uh, which Marcus and his team collected from the last FM music streaming platform, so the LFM1B dataset. Um, the data set um, is really nice, so you can can do it, can use it as well. So it's it's open openly avail available. And there you have, we have had 1.1 billion listening events. And whereas a listening event was a user, then the item the user consumed, so artist, album, track name, and the timestamp. So when did the user consume the item? Um, plus we had uh, a mainstreaminess score in, in the data set. And this mainstreaminess score told us how much the user deviated from the mainstream of the community. So the more deviation, the more like niche <laughs> content the user consumed to be, to be very, to, to describe this in a very high level way. And this allowed, this mainstreaminess score allowed us to create different types of users, these user groups. So low mainstream is high and, medium mainstream users. 
And then we wanted to see how we can model the user behavior of the users in these groups with a psychology informed recommendation approach. In order to understand the listening behavior of these users, especially of the low mainstream users, we investigated the temporal dynamics of this, of their music consumption in a little bit more detail. So what we did is we plotted the re-listening count of the musical genres that they consumed over time on a log, log scale for all three user groups. And you see these three plots here. And we made an interesting observation. All of these um, temporal dynamics follow a power law distribution. So all of them um, follow exactly this psychological model, more or less. So if you remember, so from ACT R, from this declarative memory, the base level learning equation tells us the more recently and the more frequently an item um, has been interacted with, the more the higher its activation, the easier can, it can be extracted from memory. And all of this followed this power law function. And now we find, we found <laughs> the same distribution, the same dynamics in our listening behavior. So in, in the shorter the time since a user listened to a genre, the higher its probability that the user is going to re-listen to this genre again. And this is really nice because we could then take this psychological equation, this mathematical equation from human memory theory to design an algorithm and to predict the next genre that the user is going to consume. So we did this. So we created an algorithm out of this very quite simple <laughs> equation compared this um, to several baselines, also to other baselines that incorporate time as a critical factor in the predictive model. And we found that we can improve recommendation accuracy for all the users in all three groups, but the most significant <laughs> or the, mo the strongest improvements were achieved for these low mainstream users, so for the users who consume this niche content. And our explanation was that they really tend to reconsume their own items a lot more than the others. And they seem to have a very individualistic behavior, at least in our data set. And this is really nice, so we could improve the recommendation quality for especially that user group that suffers a lot from popularity bias <clears throat> to a large extent. Thank you. Yeah, ACT R is a cognitive architecture. It has all sorts of other useful components. Um, so it has this base level learning component that we have now discussed, but it also has a spreading activation component where we can model co-occurrence with other items, which makes a lot of sense in many contexts. For instance, in the music domains, so many tracks are co-listened to with other tracks. Then it has a partial matching component where we can incorporate similarity between items in the, in the model evaluation component where we can model familiarity with items. This is highly relevant because we know also that familiarity um, shapes user preferences. So the more familiar you, you become with an item, the more, uh, the more positive your preference will be. Yeah, and then a noise component to account for some randomness in behavior because of course users have <laughs> a lot of randomness also in their behavior. And yeah, and if we, this is maybe just a follow-up to our, our previous work. Um, so we exploited then also these other components of ECTAR uh, to design algorithms and um, did then a next item prediction 
on an, an updated version of this last FM data set, so the LFM2B data set, um, which you also can um, really work with, which is great. So it's also from Marcus's group. And I think, yeah, and Alessandro is the first author of this paper who was so kind to do <laughs> the technical <laughs> setup of, of, of our talk in today. And yeah, I will not go into detail here, but um, we found that when, so recency and frequency of prior, prior exposure are very good predictors, uh, like we showed also in our previous experiment. But if we add co-occurrence between items and familiarity as, as, an, as other factors, we can even improve the prediction further. And there are all sorts of great ACT-R components which are underexplored now. So I would love to see works from this community to, to yeah, exploit more components of ACT-R in recommendations in future work. Yeah, next. Yeah, next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to briefly talk about case-based reasoning also, because they are important psychology-informed recommender systems that belong to the category of cognition-inspired recommender systems. Um, while they are a type of their uh, reflexes on their own, they are heavily influenced by, by psychological findings because they apply a sort of memory based problem solving. The idea is that you that we have a reasoner in case based reasoning, remembering previous cases that are similar to a current scenario to a current case and use this remembered previous case in order to solve new problems. The analogy would be to mimic an expert decision maker to mimic how we as humans draw on previous learned experiences and previous learning episodes when we solve new problems. And this technique was again pioneered by a cognitive scientist, by Janet Kolodner. Um, yeah, I put here some definitions of the problem. Um, so but I, I would assume that most of you are aware of the topic of case-based reasoning. If not, there's great literature also in the Recommender Systems Handbook <laughs> of, the, of, of this. But maybe we go quickly over how they work. Um, so what they require is they require, as you see, can see on the on the image on the right, they require a case-based. So this is like a, a knowledge base of well-defined cases that can be used as, as a kind of items to be recommended for solving new, new cases. And you start, so we, you start with a problem, a current problem, and then you retrieve similar cases from the case base, so cases that are similar to a current problem. And of course, if you can like use these cases to solve your problem, then great. <laughs> but it could also be that your new problem leads to improvements or adaptations of the cases in the case base. And then if that happens, then these new updated tested repaired cases are again retained in the gen in the knowledge base, in this case base. The problem are problem solving architecture that is applied in case based reasoning has been designed by psychologists and also typically similarity metrics um, are used in case based reasoning sim uh, systems that are also inspired by works in psychology. So, for instance, there is this great work by Tversky, the basic features of similarity, um, where the where we know that people tend to judge the similarity between items based on their common and distinctive features. So, also the distinctive features are employed here. 
just quickly, um, I mean, the great advantage of case-based reasoning is again, so it's extremely transparent on what basis a recommendation was produced because you have these well-defined cases, um, you have this reasoning process, you know how similarity is computed and so forth, which is a, a huge advantage. And this is why case-based reasoning recommender systems are frequently applied in, yeah, in domains where there's highly structured information or also like semi-structured information in industry context, in industrial context where there's machinery. And so, so I had pro projects with, with companies designing machineries where, where case-based reasoning was a, a good, good way to go. But of course the disadvantage is you need to have these cases. You need to have the case base, which takes up a lot of work to, to create. But they are a very good example of a psychology-informed recommender systems technique. Yeah, and I put here just a list of some, some works that employed case-based reasoning. So Robin Burke, of course, worked with case-based reasoning in this Wasabi system, um, where they used it to generate recommendations in for restaurants or for e-commerce, then case-based reasoning is is a good as good applications also travel recommendations because you have some at least semi-structured information about locations and so forth. So Francesco Ricci did some great works there, but they also have been applied in music recommender systems or to recommend even personalized investment portfolios. So Catardo did that which is a great application, of course, <laughs> especially in these days, maybe <laughs> to, to assist in financial decisions. Yeah, and one, one huge field of application is also education. Um, so we can apply case-based reasoning to help learners navigate learning settings, for instance, in, in MOOCs and so forth. Yeah, I want to also talk briefly about the cognitive process attention. Attention is important because it helps us focus our memory. <laughs> it helps us focus our on what information we should uh, get our attention to. There is different types of attention that, that psychologists describe, selective, uh, divided, alternate, and sustained. So either we focus on a specific object or on several objects, uh, at the same time, or we switch between tasks, or we have an intensive focus on a specific task. And for the last one, I would like to show you an example of how a model of sustained attention has been used in the context of recommender system. Namely, it was, so maybe this is on this next slide, yeah. Um, namely, the connection, it's, it's, the, it's a model called sustain. Um, and here uh, it was applied in the context of a learning path. So where somebody really had to focus on learning specific competences. Typically attention is also modeled by psychologists using networks. So artificial neural networks. I would not say deep networks, but I would say <laughs> ANNs, yeah. <laughs> so they are not really deep but they also use this connectionist approach because it's a dynamic process, of course, attention. And this is why um, yeah, artificial neural networks are a good choice to, to model such, such a dynamic um, process. Um, the idea is really that, yeah, to mimic also how the brain, human brain works, but of course the models, at least that I am aware of are not deep models, but they're just A and N. So <laughs> yeah, we are not not there yet. But the idea is really to 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 model attention as a form of connections that evolve over time. And this con this model of sustained attention comes originally from the field of human category learning. And in human when humans learn about category categories, um, it works like that. So for instance, if you have a child and the child is aware, learns about a dog and knows then the features of a dog, like four legs and a, and, a, and a tail and maybe some, I don't know, some, yeah, some, some ears. And then the, the kid sees a cat for the first time 
and see some similarities. So like also four legs, but the tail is maybe longer depending on the what kind of dogs the, the kid has seen before, but the ears are pointy. So they, there are similarities, but there are also differences. And what the kid then does, it's like in the, in the brain, a new category forms. And this is then the category cat. And whenever the kid sees then again cats, then the kid knows that this is a cat and this is not a dog. So this is a very simplistic <laughs> explanation of how this works. And when the kid then interacts and sees cats, um, then this category cat is activated um, in the in the brain or in the human memory. Um, because the kid knows, okay, this is the, has the features of this, this category cat. Um, so what, in this paper, what then the authors did is, so they wanted to, to model attention dynamics with, with this model from human category learning. And the idea was to recommend resources that fit to a current to a user's current learning path and to a cur the current attention focus of the user when he, the user is interacting with resources in the learning process. Um, and the idea was to improve collaborative filtering. So uh, to form a, a hybrid with a collaborative filtering. So you would get recommended uh, suitable resources, but you would then get re recommended the resources that fit to your current mental category. So to your current category of cats, for instance, <laughs> to learning about cats. Um, and this is then modeled is in, this, in this form of this artificial neural network. And the um recommendation is then a, a suitable uh, learning resource with the highest attention and focus. And I will not go into detail of this approach too much, but I, please, it, if you have questions, then we can discuss this in more detail. But what this approach allowed um, by re-ranking res learning resources that were recommended by collaborative filtering according to the attention uh, uh, focus of the user, um, the accuracy of the recommendations could be improved significantly in, in these data sets. So again, a psychology informed approach could be used to improve an existing recommendation approach in the form of, in the form of an hybrid. Yeah, so the takeaway for this First part on in the tutorial about cognition inspired recommender systems is that we can use cognitive models. So there are many of them, and there are this is, on, this is only a subset that we could cover today. There are many of them. They can help design new algorithms, like in the case of the ACT R based recommender system. They can help improve existing recommender systems, like in the case of this last example with with this attention focus. And overall, they help us understand a little bit deeper the user behavior that is that we can observe in the digital traces. Um, so the last point, uh, I think we jumped over, but maybe just to mention it briefly, um, we can also use recommender systems to augment human memory in the sense that we can, for instance, what, what improves human memory is that is creating like, like short lists. So like creating like an artificial short term memory via recommendations and on the slides and then in the paper, you see an example of where there are people, I think, from Germany did that. I think it was Tobias Schnabel who did that. So they created a list of recommendations um, that contained items, or they, they created a list of the recently interacted items for the user to, to check out. I think it was, was, was in this way. Yeah, and then also attention is really important. Um, it, it's shifts in user interests are really important and they happen all the time. We see many attention-based approaches in deep in the research on deep learning in Rexis. We see many um, approaches that that incorporate like changes of user interests over time. 
but there's really scarce work on what underlying what um, related to the underlying psychological mechanisms of attention shifts. So we can, of course, see that there are shifts in attention, shifts in user interests, but we would, I think it, it would help us understand more why this happens. And I think th psychological theory can help a lot here. But, and we, we see a, a lot of potential for future work there because it would help us foster transparency and explainability of such approaches then as well. And this would be the first part of, um, I don't see any immediate questions. Sorry for this first bumpers <laughs> with Zoom crashing and everything. And yeah, then anyone, I think Marcus. Yeah. Anyone in the room? The room is quite crowded, which is nice to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, I'll take the... Oh, is, sorry? We'll have time in the end as well, of course, but if, the, if there is any yet burning question to Elizabeth. Yeah, I had a question. Um, you mentioned randomness in the human behavior and I know that humans are very bad at making random sequences, even between two things. So can you use a power law to predict when a person's quote, quote, random behavior in their preferences will diverge from their normal pattern? So for example, most of the time they listen to rock music, but the power law yeah. says that they're more likely to what, listen to country music, you know, after so many listening sessions or something. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Yeah, and this is true. That <clears throat> So we can see some traces of this kind of outliers, more or less, <laughs> to maybe the user's standard behavior. And I'm not sure if you have seen this, if you have realized this, so in this power law plot, so there's also some some movement <laughs> on the on the line. And we see some of these randomness there. And there's some some temporal dynamics, so like weekends, weekdays, time of the day, of course. Um, people listen to different types of music when they are at work. So context context is really important. And, uh, but yeah, of course, in a curated environment with a recommendation algorithm, there's a little less randomness than you would see in the in the wild, because the system always gives you, gives you some sort some sort of incentives on what behavior to take. I hope this answers your question. Okay, it's very small here, but I assume there are no immediate other ones. So I'll just continue with uh, personality aware recommender systems, uh, which actually adopts uh, another psychological construct, uh, namely that of personality, they integrate them into a recommender system. So uh, yeah, the following, well, 40 or 45 minutes uh, will be devoted to the following topics. So first I'd like to motivate, give a little bit of a motivation of where, why personality is such an important concept and how it can be used in recommender systems research. Then we'll talk a little bit about, uh, well, uh, ways to model the personality of a human being. So I'll introduce you to, probably the most famous model, which is the big five or five factor model. Then we'll briefly, very briefly talk about how we can acquire personality traits and then going more, moving more forward into this direction of recommender systems and how to integrate personality in recommender systems. We will first talk about uh, studies that research the relationship between personality traits and preferences towards specific items or specific groups of items. So this brings us one step closer, of course, to build the recommender systems. It's a crucial component here. And then finally, I'd like to showcase you two examples uh, how personality traits are actually used to build or can actually be used to build a recommendation system. So we, of course, reviewed quite a lot of, of literature that adopts or that 
power or well, that gathers personality traits and integrates them into a recommender system. And the main motivation, or we basically found two different kinds of motivation for doing so. First one is, well, kind of the well-known cold start problem. So in particular, the new user problem, which I guess all of you are very well aware of and familiar with. Uh, so if a new user registers to a system, system doesn't know anything about uh, his or her preferences. And the idea here is how personality could be used to alleviate this problem is that even though the system doesn't know about their particular preferences, their, in, uh, their item interactions, very often through the single sign-on mechanisms that are nowadays used a lot by recommender systems or, or platforms or streaming services, uh, you can grant or the user can grant the system access to a lot of user-generated content. And based on uh, yeah, clever algorithms that are capable of uh, predicting personality from textual information uh, that can be given as this kind of user-generated content, uh, personality can be inferred from this microblogs, for instance, or uh, yeah, postings on Facebook or whatever. So actually, the we can create a well, personality profile, so to say, of the user. That can then be used in such cold start situations uh, to match this with the personality of items. So we'll talk about this concept a little bit later on. It's kind of debatable, but very often such personality aware recommender systems, also the items are assigned a personality, so to say. Or alternatively, the so second option here, uh, we can also adopt, or such systems also adopt models that directly correlate personality traits with certain preferences. So this is also something we'll talk about a little bit later on. So basically it's known that users with specific personality tend on average uh, to prefer specific uh, yeah, music genres, for instance, or book genres. So all of this can be used to alleviate cold start problem. And the second main motivation, if you categorize related work, uh, uh, why to use personality information is to adopt, adapt the level of diversity in the recommendations uh, according to the level of diversity that is known that users with a certain personality might exhibit. So again, the first step, uh, when this is the aim is to extract personality of users from their generate user generated content, for instance, and then very often uh, uh, a two step two staged approach is used So in the first stage, you would use a standard collaborative filtering matrix factorization approach, for instance, in order to create a candidate list of recommendations, and in the second step, you then use a re-ranking approach in order to adjust the level of diversity in the recommendation lists so that it roughly matches the diversity level that the kind of yeah, personality or that the, that the model, the correlation model uh, relates to the specific personality traits of the user. So for instance, um, uh, a user that is very extroverted or open to new experiences will really likely also appreciate more diversity in recommendation lists. Of course, there are many, there are tons of other factors that influence this. So bear in mind, this is, uh, of course, also a general model that can well, later on be personalized again, of course, but this is some uh, yeah, general models uh, yeah, created from uh, empirical observations. <clears throat> So how can our personality be described? I said there exists, well, uh, similar to uh, cognitive models, like Elizabeth already mentioned, a whole lot of them. <laughs> and kind of the uh, in parallel to the ACT-R architecture in, uh, yeah, in the cognition-inspired recommender systems, when we talk about personality, kind of the equivalent would be the big five model or five-factor model, or often also referred to as the ocean model ocean because uh, there are five factors according to which personality of an individual can be described. These are 
openness to new experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So some of them maybe need a little bit of explanation. So the O for openness to experience, well, nothing really complicated. So basically this describes how curious a person is versus how cautious a person is. Conscientiousness is maybe a bit more difficult concept that can be kind of interpreted as how chaotic versus organized the person is. A conscientious person is very well organized versus less conscientious. A conscientious person is rather careless and chaotic in style. Extroversion, of course, how outgoing or energetic a person is versus uh, how rather well uh, yeah, reserved a person is. Agreeableness kind of well describes how uh, yeah, how much a person tends to agree with everything versus how critical the person is on the other end of the continuum, so to say. And eroticism uh, also referred to as emotional stability relates to, well, not surprisingly, how neurotic versus emotional stable a person is. And now we can use, we can uh, well, actually use these five dimensions in the five-factor model in order to describe a person's personality. And typically this is done on a numeric scale, so stand similar to a, to a Likert rating scale with values between one and seven for each trait. So how can we exactly measure uh, or describe a user's ocean score? This can of course be uh, interpreted as a feature vector, as a five dimensional feature vector, as we'll do it in a more mathematical sense, of course, later on. So how can we measure this? And there exists a lot of different instruments as the, the psychologists call this. So mostly this relates to questionnaires. And an overview can be found here in the International Personality Item Pool, or IPIP here, if you're interested to dig a little bit deeper into the measurement of, of these traits. So now we know roughly what this ocean model is about. How can we now uh, describe a person according to these five uh, ocean dimensions, personality dimensions? Well, as so often, there are basically two different uh, ways to do this. We can either use questionnaires or we can employ a fancy machine, sometimes deep learning techniques, uh, in order to achieve this. So questionnaires are typically more accurate, but also more intrusive, more labor intensive, and from a researcher's point of view, more expensive, of course, together. Whereas machine learning approaches are often less accurate, less expensive, of course, and you can basically train uh, from a rather small amount of, uh, of data, so of questionnaire data and additional information about the user, for instance, a model, which can then be uh, applied to other users and possibly also to larger scale data. So often, uh, yeah, as already said, microblogs, so user-generated uh, text is used, also likes, Facebook likes have been used, sensor data, and so on. So there are uh, yeah, a lot of different facets here. So focusing on questionnaires, um, as said, these instruments, as they are called, can be uh, are very numerous. I think this, uh, yeah, PI, uh, PLP actually lists, I don't know, a total of over a thousand questions that can be asked in order to elicit personality traits. So I'll just uh, yeah, mention here two of the yeah, more famous ones, I would say, which is the TP, the 10 item personality inventory, as the name suggests, 10 questions. Uh, the questionnaire is available here on the University of Texas webpage. Uh, psychology department and they include questions like I see myself or statements as I see myself as disorganized and careless, which a user then had to assign the score between uh, yeah, one and five or one and seven, depending of course on the, on the scale here. So I think here it's one and five. So the user answers uh, these 10 questions and the final score for each of the openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness and eroticism trait is then computed just by linearly combining the answers. So the ratings, the extent to which this statement applies to the user over different answers. 
So this will probably be included as a term for the consensusness score relating to carelessness versus organizedness or, or the state of being well organized, so to say. Another uh, questionnaire that is claimed to be more accurate is the BFI 44. Uh, big five inventory. So again, name suggests it contains 44 questions. And also here is the link and, and an example here. I see myself as someone who's curious about many new different or many different things. So not too hard to guess. This will be an important factor, for instance, for the openness uh, trade. So I said personality traits can also uh, can on the one hand be elicited using questionnaires, but recently more and more technique uh, papers also adopt machine learning techniques, not too surprisingly here. So if you're interested and want to dip deeper, dig deeper into that, I can recommend you this quite good survey by Athuka uh, et al. Uh, 2018. This was published in a psychology journal as far as I remember. And actually, they investigated uh, a lot of different uh, approaches, also using different data sources. Uh, some of that are mentioned here, but also investigating others can basically be categorized into these. So not too surprisingly, we've already been talking a lot about text. So microblogs foremost that are shared on social media, uh, microblogging services like Twitter or the Chinese Sina Weibo. Typically, some kind of word embeddings are used to model texts and then fed into a classifier or a regression approach in order to predict each of these O, C, E, A, and N scores or dimensions. <clears throat> Images are often used. So it has been shown, for instance, that if you analyze, uh, well, or actually the, uh, the content of images that you upload, for instance, on Instagram, as well as different color specific features, use saturation, or also the presence of faces can tell us something about the personality of, uh, of a user. So uh, Bruce Verwerder, for instance, just in one person did some research on that and Marco Kalcic, so both former colleagues of mine as well. Music, of course, already talked about that. Interactions. So there is this uh, famous work by Michael uh, Kosinski at R, for instance, that investigated uh, likes, so content that has been liked on Facebook of a lot of Facebook users and tried to or basically have shown that uh, the ocean scores can be predicted with quite high accuracy based on just what which content the user liked. Sensor data have been used with this, uh, you know, massive sensor loaded smartphones or sensor packed smartphones that are available today. A lot of sensor information is available, which apps are used, uh, gyroscopes, accelerometers, and also more classical things, of course, like time, location, weather, and so on. And metadata is also a common source. So uh, yeah, examples here include, for instance, uh, how active a user is on social media, amount of shared content or properties of a user's friendship networks, so number of followers or density of the, uh, of the connection uh, network, for instance, of the user. Uh, reviewing different machine learning techniques, basically, well, not too surprisingly, a lot of different ones are found, support vector machines, random forests, neural networks, of course, well, also more and more frequently used. Uh, partly uh, simple MLPs, partly also more deep learning architectures, of course, there's a lot of data available, sufficient uh, yeah, number, then yeah, it's been used, but it's rather recently and still not as prominently, I would say, as in other domains like, like NLP, for instance, or NR. So just to give a little bit of a feeling about the, the performance that can be achieved when uh, predicting personality traits. And here I would like again to cite this uh, paper by Azuka, who actually reviewed a lot of different uh, approaches. This was actually a meta study here. 
And actually what they did is they computed a person correlation coefficient between uh, the predictions of the approaches and the ground truth according to the, well, depending on which uh, yeah, questionnaire they used to build the ground truth here with the individual approaches. So you see they they very strongly, also given the number of users, we have 62 up to 55 users. So this is this set famous work by Kosinski at R. Uh, but the general message here is that uh, the quality or the accuracy of personality trait prediction really very strongly between the different personality traits. So openness and consensuousness seem to be well, best predictable, so to say, whereas on the other end, extroversion, agreeableness, and eroticism are, uh, can be predicted only with much lower accuracy, so to say. So now that we know which models we can use, or, well, actually, we know about one by now, but this is the most famous one or most frequently used one, and we know how uh, values for according to each of these four dimensions in the ocean model can be used. Um, we next want to connect personality traits with certain preferences for items. Why do we want to do this? Well, because many studies have been conducted that actually revealed such correlations between, well, not all, but specific personality traits and consumption behavior patterns or preferences, which actually, of course, makes personality a very valuable additional uh, piece of information for recommender system. And I'd like to showcase you here, uh, give you here three examples, uh, which studied exactly this correlation. So the first one uh, is an earlier work by Ivan Cantador that actually related personality traits and preferences for genres in three different domains, in movies, music, and books. And actually what they did is they investigated uh, likes information. So again, which of, well, a cohort of 53,000 Facebook users, uh, which content they liked, and the content is, was described on the level of genres, 16 genres in each of in each of these domains were considered. And what they then did is they kind of, uh, for each of the genre, they looked, or for each of the genre, they computed the average personality score, so the average OCE, A and N score of the people who liked the genre. And then uh, this resulted, of course, in such very nice but rather big tables in here. And I just want to exemplify it here for, uh, for the book and the movie domain. And what you can see here, for instance, is that uh, people who like a specific genre, a specific book genre, for instance, uh, are more likely to have a rather, well, a specific level or who's a specific range within a specific range of values for each of the personality traits. So for instance, here, I don't know if you focus on the erotic people, then we see that uh, people who like crime movies seemingly have on average much higher neuroticism score than uh, those who like, was an example, thriller here, for instance. Of course, they, the difference is not so big, but still significant. Uh, yeah, on the other end, oh yeah, educational was very low, as you can see here. So neurotic people, yeah, people who like educational books and to be rather, or rank rather low on the neuro, uh, neurotic, neuroticism dimension, sorry. <laughs> so we don't have time anyways to go too much into detail in here, but it's very interesting that uh, there are relations between liking for specific genres and specific personality traits. So I said another motivation was uh, why personality is used is to diversify recommendation lists. And this is exactly what was studied by Janet Al in, 20, in their 2013 paper here. So uh, they conducted a user study with around 180 participants from China. And then uh, actually uh, computed their 
or the diversity of the content they consumed using the Gini index over different, uh, so in the movie domain it was, over different attributes of the movies. So the genres, uh, actors or actresses, production countries, directors, and so on. And then they correlated the user's preferences according to this diversity scores with their ocean traits. And what they found again was not like, not super high, but still significant correlations between the two for certain, so between the diversity here depicted in the, in the columns and the personality scores depicted here in the rows. So we can see here that for instance, uh, neurotic people tend to enjoy a higher level of diversity when it comes to the directors of a movie or open people tend to enjoy a higher level of diversity when it comes to actors or actresses, which is for the openness trade again, not a big surprise. Good, and finally, there is also some work that actually connects nicely to the next part of, the to uh, of this tutorial, which is uh, about effect aware recommender systems. It was actually an earlier work we did uh, in the context of the new project here, where we uh, investigated the relationship between personality traits and how, in terms of emotions, a user uh, would perceive a classical music piece. So the study was focused on Beethoven's third uh, symphony, Eroica, and 240 participants were used. Uh, well, used is probably the wrong term. <laughs> we are looked at and actually asked to uh, label that. And then we computed again correlations between the personality scores uh, and the emotional labels that users said they, per they perceived when listening to this classical music piece. And again, we found, for instance, yeah, small but significant correlations between, for instance, the personality traits of extroversion and the perception of tenderness in this musical piece. So if you want to know more, of course, this is, can just focus on a uh, on a very small snapshot, let's say, or a few of, of these results here. <clears throat> but you see basically here, the, the summary is that a lot of studies showed that there is some correlation between personality traits and certain preferences for certain kinds of materials, for certain kinds of items. <clears throat> and these items, of course, vary depending on the domain. So we reviewed a lot of works or categorized works on personality aware recommender systems according to the domain that they were employed. Not surprising, a lot of works focus on the entertainment domain. So kind of the, the usual suspects, movie recommendation, music recommendations, images and books, computer games, but also kind of a little bit more niche topics, I would say like recipes or recommending interest groups for social media platforms or even recommending conference attendees. Maybe this is something we could try out next year's Rexis conference. Let's see. So when categorizing these different, uh, these different approaches and trying to, to make some general remarks about our findings as for the, uh, the approaches that are used to create recommendations or to include personality in recommendation algorithms, we observed that most approaches that are personality aware are still quite simple. <clears throat> so they are either standalone approaches or simple hybrids where the standalone approaches, so the ones that only use personality, usually treat personality just as a content descriptor. So I said that items personality is defined and then they just use a simple memory-based uh, content-based filtering approach. So directly search for items that are similar to the items the user consumed already and the similarity is defined over these personality feature vectors. So five-dimensional in case of this ocean score. Or sometimes there is also even a more direct approach like, uh, like users and items are directly matched through their ocean scores profile. 
when there are hybrid approaches and there also exist quite a few then they integrate this personality into some collaborative filtering or content-based filtering approach so very often this is used in a standard k nearest neighbor fashion so using memory-based approaches which are uh well it's core components of course a similarity function and very often uh such approaches just linearly combine collaborative similarity computed from ratings with similarity that is computed on the personality traits of the users or personality traits of the items and the content-based similarity measure. This can also happen. So these are the two approaches that often occur, that can often be found. Sometimes personality is also treated as a context factor in a context-aware factorization machine, for instance, as done in this work. Uh, sometimes MF approaches are extended by uh, personality factors, and sometimes you can also find simple graph-based technique that, for instance, uh, yeah, model items uses a graph and then uh, extract certain sub-graphs from the anti-graph based on some personality constraint, like dropping all items that are way off the user's personality score, for instance. So this is also something that is found but not a lot of work, works to exist so i think this was the only one or maybe there was one other one that we found here <clears throat> so as already said uh, personality of items is very often in this context of personality where recommender systems also modeled over the ocean scores that is just extracted from some user generated text yeah whether this is really valid of course is debatable but I'll just give you one example here on the next slide, which was this work by Yang and Wang that actually targets the computer games domain. And this is an approach that's purely based on personality traits. So users and items are both modeled as a five dimensional vector over their ocean scores. So the user personality profile and the game personality profile respectively UP and GP is used. For the user, uh, the ocean, this vector is predicted from social media postings. And for items, these are either, the, well, actually the office proposed two strategies, either predicting the ocean scores uh, or aggregating the ocean scores of the users played the game or extracting ocean scores from the game reviews, so kind of assuming that the personality, so to say, if we want to call it like that, of the item can be extracted from the personality revealed in the reviews, in the game reviews of the game. So, and how can we now build, or how do they, do the authors build a recommender system out of this? Well, actually, they um, propose three different variants. The first one, very simple one, just directly match the users and the game's personality. So if you want to compute the similarity between the game GI and the user UJ, they actually just suggest to compute cosine similarity between the corresponding uh, yeah, five-dimensional ocean vectors. They propose another variant. Uh, well, that could be called a, a content-based filtering variant that actually uh, compute the similarity between a game and our target user by looking at the other games that our user already uh, interacted with, and then compute this as a weighted sum over, again, the personality profiles of the game under consideration. So this GI for which we want to uh, know the similarity and all the games in the user's interaction history, so this C U J. So this is pretty much a simple, simple uh, way you would also do it in a simple collaborative, uh, not collaborative, sorry, content-based filtering variant. And then actually, they also uh, propose the simple linear combination of both using two weighting terms. So I said, very simple variant only uses, uh, or solely uses personality information. They conducted a user study, 60 players around, uh, and actually eventually found that this 
approach, the second approach that actually only used the or only compute the cosine similarity between games themselves seem to outperform the other ones. The reason I would assume would be that the user is just or the, the way how items personality is extracted is well kind of too to different from the ways from the more direct way the user's personality is assigned, but this would just be my assumption in this case. So, and then I'd like to show you one other example in the music domain, which is also the domain uh, I would say I'm or we're experts in. Also, Elizabeth, of course, we've done a lot of research on music recommender systems. Uh, so have Lou and Tinterf, of course. And in 2018, they proposed uh, personality informed recommender systems for uh, songs that is actually based or that adopts a uh, re ranking architecture. So actually, in the first step, they use a factorization machine to create initial set of recommendations. And then in the personalization step, they re-rank the results of this candidate list in a way that they adapt the level of diversity according to the diversity level uh, that the user might appreciate given their personality preferences. So are these components, preferences, diversity, and personality information, so to say. So um, it's also, <clears throat> sorry. So we have basically three components here. We have to model the user again using ocean scores that in this case, something particular, uh, we did not do this automatically through some machine learning fashion, but really, uh, the time to explicitly ask users to fill in uh, the 10 item personality inventory. So these 10 questions from which personality can then be uh, yeah, inferred. They model the items through some uh, meta information like the release year of a song, artist, genre, and also some more content specific information like the tempo and the musical key. And then correlated actually or conducted another user study that correlated ocean scores, personality scores, and certain well, diversity needs. Needs is maybe the wrong term, but kind of some desired levels of diversity according to the ocean scores. And diversity was defined as intralist diversity of a given recommendation list over genre, artist, and key. So over three factors here that were found to have the highest correlations with some of the personality traits. So a bit more formally, we, for the sake of time, will not dig too deep into that. But basically, the idea is they created an, uh, an initial uh, candidate recommendation list using a factorization machine, this well-known million songs data set. And then they kind of uh, created another final recommendation list that starts with just the top song here from the original list O here, and then add tracks continuously in a way that minimizes this objective function here. And this objective, uh, yeah, this function here actually contains the rank of uh, item P in the original list O. So the higher the rank, or actually the lower the rank, so the higher on top this item is, uh, the more likely it should be added, of course. But on the other hand, they also consider this diversity model in here. Okay. And this diversity, this overall diversity here is computed as said as the interlist diversity or dissimilarity that list R has when we add item P, so this item under consideration to the list of final recommendations R. And this is uh, this overall diversity is then described kind of as this weighted sum over the individual diversities. And these are exactly these individual diversities, uh, or better here, the personalized factors. So the theta weight derived from this model that correlates the individual personality scores with diversity preferences. So this is a quite, yeah, it's, it's not a complicated model, but it has a lot of components. So if you want to know more, you can just ask me later or also read the, the thing here. It's not 
the math is not complicated, but it's maybe not too easy to, to really fully get into it. So again, they conducted another user study in order to investigate the results, the quality of the results, and well, not overly surprisingly, uh, participants found the re-ranking approach better than just pres being presented this orig original recommendation list. Oh, off, well, not off, but all in terms of uh, perceived quality, diversity, and also user satisfaction. Good. So this was the second part, personality. If there are no other burning questions. I don't know, we actually uh, said we want. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Oh, uh, so uh, I... So you explained a lot about using um, existing personality um, questionnaires such as the Big Five to learn the personalities of the user and using it in the recommender system. So I was wondering if you have any ideas of uh, finding the or forming a user personality from the user uh, item consumption data in an unsupervised way and using it. Uh, yeah, directly. I mean, of course, you could do this. I'm not aware of work that actually does it, but uh, you mean you could uh, you could use just the user item interactions uh, and in an unsupervised way identify certain categories and relate them to to personality, right? Yes. This is something. This is something. That could be done, of course. I'm frankly not aware of work that actually does this and use it that way for, for recommender systems, I have to say. OK, Maybe thank you. Is, I, I don't claim that we reviewed all, <laughs> that we really could identify all works here in this survey. For the sake of time, I don't know, is there any, any break planned here? We are already a little bit behind schedule. So, it's up to you, maybe. It's up to you. We've got. It's up uh, to us. So, mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So I think then if you agree, Liz, I would just continue. Yeah, yeah but I, th I think there might have been a question. Is somebody ah, okay. Fan? Sorry, it's so. It's, I, uh, very yeah, small. I, I do want to comment uh, the questions. Um, so in the industry, at least our company do have <laughs> yeah. uh, recommend uh, based on individual customer profile mm -hmm. so we don't really uh, have studied the personality but we do have a profile that's based on customers shopping behavior mm -hmm. yeah yeah so uh, just want to <laughs> address that uh, okay okay yeah in the I industry mean, I, don't I don't know i'm not aware of this study like in research but in practice yeah, yes. i mean I'm, I'm, i know this is very important in particular for companies and for industries also to play <laughs> <laughs> also to make sure this i mean it's 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 all of this brings up a lot of ethical questions of course i mean if you know about the the if you can create a personality profile then you know a lot about your user of course and um we are not quite yeah i would say we are not trying to figure out the personality profile but it's more like their shopping profile. If mm -hmm. they shop for their kids, then we recommend kids product. It's uh, not really oh, to okay. figure it's out who wrong. you are. Oh, we are okay. not. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say thanks for the comment. I just wanted to say I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of that. And I talked to a lot of companies, of course, about that. And they were kind of, oh, yeah, we cannot do that. Any personality prediction because it's uh, it's it's ethically problematic, which, of course, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, yeah. Yeah. it is or it could be, of course. Yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I think I, I would just continue. Since Maybe a last question, uh, if possible. Uh, oh, yeah, so sure. th th thank you for the explanations. I was just curious about the uh, ocean model, and uh, I was wondering, like, is it like has it, has there been any studies to verify that uh, it is uh, like steady and that the results are the same, like with the same people over time or even like on different days? Because uh, 
Yeah, I was wondering uh, how. I mean, the good thing, the good thing, and this also is a nice bridge to effect aware, effect aware recommender systems, is that this personality traits, and in particular also the ones uh, elicited through this ocean model, are really stable or quite stable. Maybe not over the lifetime of a person, but uh, over at least ten years. So I think a recent study, like one year ago said that yeah they do change so the previous assumption was they almost never change over the lifetime uh, a year ago i can't remember but someone found that they do change but very slowly and you could say that about well each decade some major personality uh, characteristics might change a bit but it's really it, it's very different to affect aware recommender systems which are exactly the, the opposite and very dynamic in nature so to say okay thank you and uh, another thing uh, i was wondering if you had like some links to resources or if you could elaborate on how the axes were chosen uh, especially since um, yeah i see that uh, like one of the axes is opposing like being friendly and being rational and uh, i i think that there was an axis like this and i was wondering like how, how could that be because uh, it feels quite surprising uh, especially uh, like since I consider myself a rational person, well, uh, <laughs> it's it's still very satisfying <laughs> as a nexus. So yeah, I was wondering like if you had some resources or uh, how how this was uh, chosen. I think there are I don't know whether I included it similarly not, but there are there are links and references in our longer survey article. I have to say we don't have the time. I don't have yeah. the time here to show it. But also to say, ocean is not the only model. I mean, this is the the. I talked to a psychologist at the conference of New Cigar or a couple of years ago, and they kind of said, yeah, it's the least disputed, so to say, but there are also, uh, yeah, it's highly debatable, so to say. There are also other models like Hexaco, for instance, that has six dimensions, and there are a lot of models, in fact. So yeah. it's just the ones that most people could, at least to, to a certain extent, agree on. So this is more really a pragmatic solution. And since we're as computer science usually not engage too deep into psychological and philosophical discussions, I yeah. have to say here, it's, yeah, that's the reason why I choose it. Yeah. But you'll find the links in the in the longer survey article. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Good. So then, let's continue with effective recommender system. So again, the structure is part in a very similar fashion. So first, motivating why uh effective cues like mood and emotion uh, should be used in recommender systems then tell you how they can be modeled how we can acquire them and again give you two brief examples of how such cues can be used integrated into a recommender system so um, again psychologists distinguish very clearly between uh emotions and mood which are two most prominent example for uh, for effective cues and recommender systems, whereas, well, computer science often do not. Computer scientists often do not. So just to very briefly set the ground, uh, what is the difference? Emotion is actually always uh, an effective response to a stimulus, and it is of very high intensity. So if I show you an image of a crying child, unless you are a psychopath, you will probably, it will cover, uh, probably cause you some emotion of sadness or fear or whatever. And this emotion is only of rather short duration. And the set has a very a direct stimulus. So at most, yeah, a few seconds to at most some minutes. Whereas on the other hand, mood is kind of a lower intensity or an effective experience of lower intensity and not a direct response to a stimulus. Uh, it lasts longer, so typically minutes to a couple of hours. Basically, these two constructs have been used uh, as that. This is how psychologists define it in the recommender systems literature. Isn't, it's very often not that clear, so to say. So also, I have to admit, I'm not always uh, perfectly following this definition in the, the next couple of minutes, I would say. So apologies for that already. But just, you know, psychologists have a very clear separation between the two concepts. So in recommender systems, uh, research uh, effective cues are often used to further personalize uh, the results, tailor them to the current 
mood or emotion of the user. Uh, and they often exploit, again, correlations between uh, item preferences according to certain characteristics like genre or content features, mood, of course, and sometimes is that also kind of the interplay between preferences, personality, and mood or emotions. So just very briefly, so you get an idea about how uh, mood and emotion can be modeled. So the main uh, types of models can be characterized as categorical models, dimension models, or hybrid models. So categorical models, as the name suggests, means you have distinct categories. The most famous example probably is Ekman's, a model of six basic emotions. Uh, yeah, basically that comprise of happy, sad, or disgusting, fear, surprise, and anger here. And they assume that each human emotion can be categorized into exactly one of these distinct categories. Dimensional models, on the other hand, kind of assume that uh, emotions can have or can be described along uh, a continuum of possible intensities and also levels of pleasantness. So the most famous uh, dimensional model is the so-called valence arousal model, where valence describes along a continuum uh, how pleasant or how positive or negative an emotion is. And according to the arousal dimension, describes how intense we feel this emotion, so is it a high or rather low intensity. Uh, some models also add power or dominance dimension that actually refers to how much a user feels to be in control of their emotions, so it relates to emotion validation. And then there also exist hybrid models that can basically combine the two, so that actually instead of the valence and the arousal dimensions, they use each of the categorical dimensions or uh, categories as one dimension, and within them uh, are capable of describing the emotions uh, along these dimensions. So probably the well, one of the very famous examples is uh, a Russell circumplex model. And here you also see what I mean with uh, valence and the arousal space. So we have valence along the x-axis, positive or a negative emotion, and the intensity level or arousal along the y-axis. So you see that, for instance, uh, I don't know, sleep has a very low arousal, of course, excited or aroused. It's a very high arousal, and here it's positive versus negative uh, examples here. Uh, an example for a Oh, sorry, an example for a hybrid model is Geneva's emotion, uh, the Geneva emotion wheel by Klaus Scherer. And you see that actually here we have distinct categories, so a categorical model, but each of these uh, or in the intensity of uh, how much each emotion in the category applies is defined along either a continuous scale or more often along an ordinal scale here. So here it's six different levels of intensity that the user can use to describe I don't know, interest here or pride or joy or whatever. So uh, I'll go a bit faster over that because most of that is quite similar to what we discussed about uh, personality. So again, effective cues can be acquired either explicitly, we can ask the users or inferred via machine learning techniques from user-generated data. So either asking the user, of course, it's more accurate, also more labor intensive, and just typically just let the user choose one from a set of categories, or sometimes also ask the user, or present the user a valence arousal space and ask them to position a cursor, say where they are currently would locate themselves, which is of course a bit more complex because you need to explain to the user what valence and arousal is if it's not a user who is already well versed in, in psychology. Yeah. And for machine learning techniques, the same as set for our personality holds. So if we compare uh, effect aware to uh, personality aware recommender systems, we find much less work on effect awareness uh, than for the personality one. Um, the reason is probably exactly what we discussed about. It's much harder to elicit the data. The data is very dynamic. And if you consume an item, then even within the item, very often uh, the mood or the emotion of a user might change. So it's temporarily way more dynamic. 
So again, works are quite simple typically. So sometimes they even just match the mood of the item to the mood of the user or in a very simple fashion extends uh, uh, content-based or collaborative fit. So if you look at the domains, there are also only fewer domains. So uh, effective cues used for fashion, for location recommendation. Music is a very important target domain, which is uh, quite understandable because actually uh, from user studies, we know that music is known to evoke very, very strong emotions. And also vice versa, psychological studies have shown that mood regulation is the one most important reason why people listen to music. So there's really a strong relationship between emotions, mood or affect and music, uh, yeah, and music. So just to give you one quick example here, um, how this can be used. This is a rather simple approach here proposed by WDR in 2017. And the, uh, they proposed a recommender for points of interest, so for locations, and actually um, investigated posts shared on Sina Weibo, I think it was again, so a Chinese microblogging service, and described users using some uh, lexicon-based to so keyword-based emotion classification approach. So actually each user was described um, by an emotion vector according to this dictionary and each item, so each location was described again by an emotion vector just by considering, by aggregating the emotions of user postings that were made at the location where this point of interest was. So just using the GPS coordinates. And then they <clears throat> proposed, again, three different recommendation approaches. So uh, the main one, I would say, is this user-based collaborative filtering one, where actually they included or they actually compu or they computed similarity, emotional similarity between two users, you or as or the similarity, sorry, they computed the similarity between two users based on these two components. So the general emotional similarity between user U and V and the location specific similarity defined again over the emotions. So this component here, the emotion specific similarity is again, very simple and straightforward. So it, they just take these uh, fixed dimensional emotion vectors of user U and V, regardless of time, regardless of location, and then just computed the cosine similarity between them. And here in this location specific similarity between our target user U and uh, other users V, they computed again cosine similarity, but here between the current emotional state of our target user, so this guy U here, and the emotion of the other user when he or she was at specifically this location. So these are the two components that integrate location and emotional information into the similarity function here. They also proposed another approach, so can be regarded as an item-based collaborative filtering approach that actually only considered the locations already visited by a user and then used the similarity between uh, uh, yeah, the item under consideration, so the potential candidate item and the emotional vector of the items that the user already compute, uh, already visited. And then, well, the hybrid kind of yeah, can easily do a linear combination between the two. Did not really perform a study, but as a final example here, also targeting points of interest, I'd like to point you to this work by Marius Kaminskas a bit earlier, uh, 2013. And here the aim was to recommend pieces, music pieces that are suited for a particular point of interest. So this is quite interesting because this is independent of a particular user. The user is just assumed to be at a specific place of interest where this place of, uh, and the, the goal is to search music that fits this place of interest. How are these modeled? So the place of interest is modeled in a bag of words fashion uh, where I 
think a couple of hundred points of interest, uh, like monuments, uh, opera houses, Eiffel Tower, London Bridge, and so on, uh, have been annotated in terms of emotions they provoke in a web survey by users. The same was done with a couple of hundreds of music tracks using the same vocabulary, so 24 emotional categories, also from some psychological model, which I don't no, right now I have to I have to admit. Uh, and then, in additionally, uh, to increase the, the music collection or the potential uh, music songs to be recommended, they also used an auto tagger in order to predict through some content features, uh, yeah, the emotional categories for unknown songs. So they then used this auto tagging based approach. So actually using or matching the bag of words representations of music directly with the bag of words representation of places of interest. So that it is just, since it's categorical information, just using the Chaka similarity, describing the overlap of the term sets for uh, the track and the place of interest, basically. The so second approach adopted some knowledge-based uh, similarity score that is derived from the knowledge graph through some yeah, path specific statistics and then in a the hybrid approach they combined these two variants uh, so auto tag based so the content based and the knowledge based approach and in the user study basically uh, yeah they found that the hybrid approach so integrating a knowledge base and additionally uh, yeah, this auto tags, so the emotional tags assigned to songs and to uh, to locations outperformed all the other ones. I think for the sake of interest, we're gonna skip, or not for the sake of interest, but for the sake of time, we're gonna skip that. Just saying, we also had last year a very nice uh, digital uh, media exhibit at the Oz Electronica Festival where we actually also integrated or visualized the music collection of half a million of pieces as a as a nice city specific as a nice city landscape and uh actually clustered music pieces according to the similarities and yeah the user could then kind of interact with uh with the music yeah here you see alessandro by the way so a colleague here in the in the room uh, yeah, if you're interested in that, it's a pretty cool system, so you can have a, a look at the video here, but we don't have the time, unfortunately, to dig deep into that, but also contained an emotion, uh, a wear component, so to say, where then the, the landscape changed according to the emotion that the user selected or that was inferred from, uh, from the Twitter stream of the exhibit. So happy, angry, uh, fearful, getting foggy and, and so on. I think we can now change and go back to Liz. Would you yeah. like Liz? Would you try to uh, do screen sharing again? Can we give it a try? Yeah, I, can I think try. it worked quite smoothly. I think it worked quite smoothly, but I don't know what you prefer. Do just yeah, yeah, continue, sure. or do you want to share? Yeah, we can. I yeah. Now let's continue. Like so, maybe you. It worked quite okay. smoothly. I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. To not risk anything, my Zoom crashing again. Just, yeah. Okay, so let, in the so we talked now a lot about algorithms, methods, models, but now let's talk about evaluation. Because in evaluating recommender systems specifically from the user perspective, we draw a lot from the field of psychology. So I will discuss briefly some psychological aspects of the user in in experience, then I will highlight a few key influencing factors that shape the user experience when they interact with the recommender system that you as a recommender systems um, creator should be aware of. And then I will talk about how we can design suitable user studies in order to evaluate user experience in a meaningful way. And this is where we draw a lot, like I said, from methodologies that have been developed by psychologists for, for many, many years. Even so, but before quickly a brief recap of Rex's evaluation, I think, yeah, you, you guys all know this. Um, 
we have traditionally in our community a strong focus on algorithmic performance, even on like classic metrics of accuracy. Um, I, nowadays, we of course have more metrics, so we not only look at accuracy, but we look at diversity, novelty, serendipity. Now there's a lot of work on fairness of recommendations, and I think this is great. So our community really evolves in creating new evaluation concepts. Um, in the classic recommended evaluation methods, we have offline evaluation, we have online evaluation, and in online evaluation, we we already doing this user experiment, so we observe what users do in the real in the wild, either we via A B tests or by conducting user studies. And I mean, so for maybe for the first time attendees, the fresh new PhD students, um, of course, you can always go to the recommender systems handbook or to practice to the book on practical recommender systems uh, to learn more about this. And what I like, what it's not on the slide is now we have more and more work in the community doing simulation studies of understanding long time user behavior, which is also great. But now let's talk about this psychological perspective, about this user centric perspective. So when we um, look at recommendations from the user perspective, we look at the so called user experience. And this is um, can be defined as the, the delivery of a recommendation output to the user and the user's interactions with this output, with these recommendations. And when we study user experience, uh, we can understand many very relevant issues, especially for real world systems. So how are they, how is the recommender system used? It could be used in a different way than we have anticipated it in the designing phase. What is the perceived value of the system? And what are factors to shape uh, whether a person takes a recommendation or does not take a recommendation? And those factors um, could be like influenced by the motivation of the user, by the perceived trust the user has to the system by how the recommendations are perceived and so forth. And studying this user experience we requires us to work with users, not just to compute metrics on data sets, but to set up user experiments and user studies to conduct field trials and so forth. And this is of course a challenging task to set up experiments in a way that they're that they let you draw meaningful and, and statistically valid uh, conclusions. There's um, again a chapter in the handbook of how to set up recommend or how to evaluate recommender systems with user experience and I will show you some some strategies how to do that also in in the next couple of minutes. Yeah I mean here's just a list I will not go over that of how user experience has been evaluated some pointers to um, papers. So those are papers that are older. There are also newer papers. Um, yeah, we have collected a lot of references in our in our article. But now I would like to to talk about psychological factors that influence user experience that are important. One of them is co called cognitive dissonance. And you see cognitive dissonance in the picture on the right. So this is the fox. I'm not sure if you know the story of the fox who cannot reach the grapes and says, ah, I don't want them anyways, because they're, they're not, not, not tasty. This is a, a good example of, yeah, a dissonant, dissonant behavior. Um, cognitive dissonance in the way it is described by uh, Festinger in his seminal work on cognitive dissonance is that's an aversive cognitive affective response to exposure to contradicting information. And you see this already, so it's an effective response, so it's a strong response, and you want to have a positive affective response, of course, to your recommender system, not a con not an aversive one, because if you, if there's cognitive dissonance, um, it can lead that users lead to the fact that users don't have trust the system anymore and don't use the system anymore, and this can happen when the recommendations are inconsistent with what the user th thinks that their preferences are, and this can happen when the user model is not correct, or when the user make model. Um, does not reflect maybe the current preferences because it has it was based on on data that the user has provided a long time ago and so forth. 
cognitive dissonance can also happen when a user re-evaluates a choice that they have made when they have interacted with a recommendation. So maybe they have followed a recommendation for a product to buy, and then they find the product not to be satisfactory, and they re-evaluate the choice. So they don't like what the recommendation has made them do, <laughs> more or less. And this is important factor that influences the user experience. Another one is so maybe could is is um, persu persuasion. Persuasion is a communication process, and in the end, so when a user interacts with the recommend system, it's a form of a communicative process. And we we see this now because we have conversational interfaces, recommender systems. And in this communication process, the system more or less convinces the user to adapt their behavior or to adapt their preferences to, to take a specific decision. And in, in, in persuasion, um, it's such an important thing that uh, there's a whole bunch, a whole field that has developed around it, you know, which is called persuasive recommender system. There are recommender systems, and you can get an overview of this topic in this book that um, I put a screenshot on the right side of the slide. And here the users in persuasion are influenced by the system itself, by the recommendation, which is then the message, by the user, which is the target of the communication process and the context in which the recommendation is delivered. And in the end, so you want to have your recommendations ideally to be persuasive in the sense that uh, they have high credibility. So this would lead to a high persuasive um, power of your system. Um, then research, so Paolo Cremonesi et al. have shown that recommendations are persuasive um, if the level of novelty is fitting to what the user um, expects. Then Felfernig et al. showed that persuasive items are attractive items. And uh, again, Tinteref and here uh, Judith Masterf has shown that um, giving explanations make recommendations more persuasive. So those are factors that would influence how your users evaluate the system. So adding explanations is definitely a, a good idea, according to what Tinterf and Mastov have, have shown. Could, yeah. Then um, interaction methods and interfaces strongly influences influence the user experience. And there are all sorts of like, cognitive biases that come into play here, L lots of psychological mechanisms and like how, uh, how if, if the interface is overloaded, for instance, that would be a factor um, that leads to hi higher cognitive load and then it's to less, less well-received interface. And here I would point to a study um, by by Bart Kninburg et al. And they, they studied different types of interaction methods. So like to provide the classic recommendation list, a sorting method to sort recommendations according to preferences, then an explicit method to elicit preference, uh, elicit um, preferences. So via a weighting mechanism, then an implicit method to assign weights based on the history of interact user item interactions, hybrids. And in the end, they found in a user study that most people like to have a hybrid combination of all these interaction methods. And such a result could only be received with a user-centric evaluation, of course. Um, yeah, more details on different types of user interaction methods uh, would just point you to, to the paper by Yuga Watts and Janach from 2017. If you want to find out more um, how suitable or how, how good user interaction methods should look like. Could you go to the next slide? Yeah, and like I said, so we can find out about these, these influencing factors and about what makes users satisfied with a recommender system only by designing user studies. Problem with user studies is <laughs> user, they have a lot of issues. <laughs> and if you have conducted user studies, you might be well aware of the, those issues. So, because user studies frequently rely on self reports. And self reports mean that a user tells you about 
um, their preferences, but they might be have might be having like an a latent <laughs> preference that they're even not really aware of. Then self reports require representative samples of participants, and this is really hard to get, um, especially in academia. So many user studies are done with our students, but this is not necessarily a representative sample of participants of the system. Um, uh, what psycho psychologists frequently do is they they use a late, they apply a latent factor analysis on the collected self reports, such as exploratory factor analysis, um, to find like inter-item correlations and to group them into the distinct dimensions and then they run a confirmatory factor analysis on independent data in order to to validate the extracted collected um, dimension factor structure and this is how psychologists do it and this is how also researchers in, in recommender systems can do it of course and this is highly laborsome of course. And hence, the community has put forward several frameworks to facilitate uh, the setting up of user-centric evaluations and to support researchers in testing their, in formulating hypotheses, in testing hypotheses, and in designing user studies. And I would just briefly point you to um, such frameworks in the next slides. Um, there is the framework by Kninbock and Williamson. And here they have employed several theories of, of, user, of human attitude and behaviors, of user's experience and uh, technology acceptance to, as a basis to design the framework. Um, the framework enables to study subjective perception of recommendations such as like the perceived quality of a system or the, the perceived usability of a system and they combine this or they enable to combine this with um, a user's personal characteristics and the contextual characteristics and so in order to find out what influences the users the, the particular user's experience with the recommender system um, the, the con like the situational characteristics, you see this, you see like an image of this framework in the on the right side of the slide. So this contextualization would be, um, for instance, the the goal, the choice goal that the user wants to achieve. So what kind of decision the user wants to make with by using the recommender system, or what is the overall system trust of the user towards the recommender system. And the personal characteristics, um, those are um, in green in this image. So like this is, would be the perception of the usability, the perception of the quality or the appeal of the overall system and the experience um, like with the system, with the recommendation process overall. And um, then the interaction quality, like the rating, consumption, the user's retention with the system. And the personal characteristics of the user uh, are the gender of the user, the expertise, and the level of privacy that the user desires to have when interacting with the system. And the final part is of the of this framework is the system characteristics. So in order to evaluate the in order to contextualize um, the user experience um, in the framework you know like the algorithm that is employed the interaction method is employed the presentation type that is employed and this is a really nicely a framework that's really nice to use it offers a lot of lot of features features a lot of guidance so this is a good good strategy to work with such a framework when designing a user study there's also another one that i would like to show you um, which is the rescue framework by pull it all um, and here the aim for this framework was to uh, again assess these perceived qualities of a recommender system, so like the usability, if the interface uh, suitable for the for achieving the the user's goal when interacting with the system, the overall user satisfaction with the system, and the attention of the user that the user has when why why is the user coming to the system. 
and all of these these like high level um, topics are like qualities, belief, user attitudes <clears throat> are then described by these categories, uh, like is shown in this plot on the right side. And again, the idea is really to help the the person designing a user study being very specific on formulating the hypothesis and in setting up the evaluation and asking the, the right questions to, so to say in order to have the <laughs> at least the chance to, to achieve suitable and meaningful conclusions. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are two questions, I think, in the chit. Mm -hmm. Anna, as a no, client. there was one Thank you. Thank uh, you. which I already tried yeah. to yeah. answer. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so overall, this whole topic of user-centric evaluation is, is a rich topic. Um, we cover a, a lot, I think, in our paper. And I think the main, main, yeah, the main uh, takeaway for this is, because this is really very briefly in the interest of time, is that, um, yeah, this is heavily inspired by uh, psychological research. I think we as a community should take the findings from this other community and, and help because it helps us a lot drawing valid conclusions. That's what I'm saying. Yeah? But I think, Marcus, we could move on mm -hmm. to the last part. Ah, we have 20 minutes left. Thank you, Ramona. Ah, then it's not that much. Okay, great. Um, ah, okay. But, Ah, it's good to know. But I will run. I, I will you. soon. I will very soon run out of battery. Ah, okay. <laughs> One minutes. But maybe you can uh, continue with the grand challenges with the yeah. So anyways, and I will just quickly grab my my charge up. Sure. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Thanks for the notice that the upload. Ah, yeah. Thanks. Okay, then we'll we'll check the slides on the website. So maybe the last upload did not work. Okay. Um, so for the last part of of this tutorial, so we could talk about evaluation, of course, for long for for ever. Um, but we now come to the last part of the tutorial where we talk about these challenge grand challenges that we see for the field of psychology informed recommender systems and grand challenges in the sense that we hope that this tutorial sparked the interest of many people in the audience on conducting research in this in this field so for the topic of cognition informed recommender systems um, we have seen that there are many cognitive models that apply very nicely to the task of recommender systems, because this is drawing information from our memory is, is similar to drawing information from a database and creating finding similarities, um, making recommendations. And specifically, previous work has shown a strong relation between uh, human memory processes and user behavior, because we have seen this, this simple mathematical models that fitted very nicely the user item interactions. Um, like in the case of the ACT-R model. <clears throat> in the end, there is more work that could be done. There are more cognitive models and there are for sure more cognitive processes that could be explored that apply to, to understanding user behavior. <clears throat> I mentioned this briefly. So there is um, also the opportunity to support our memory in retrieving objects using recommender systems. As digital support tools because it's like we yeah so we 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 are exposed to so many items and so much information online when we're interacting in an online information systems so that our, our memory basically also suffers and here there's a lot of potential from my point of view for doing future work i mean there is some work that has tried to do this um the one by, by elsweiler 27 at uh, 2007 and here they um they dis they improved they designed an information management tool that is based on research how humans recover from memory lapses 
so they they took like uh, findings from memory research and when humans recover from memory lapses so they they so basically so other parts of the memory get then activated and new connections form um, in a very positive and very simple form and they created a uh, an improved information management tool based on that. So this is a promising research direction. And then there is another work, um, My Life Bits, it's called, where they aimed to develop, where they developed a system in order to, that reminds users for, uh, that they have stored some bits. Um, and they claim that this helps augmenting the human memory. So it should not say stored its, should say stored bits. So I would be happy to have such a system that reminds me of all the papers that I have stored <laughs> in my to read folder. <laughs> From some time to time, I would be happy to have recommendations on what papers could, could fit to what I'm doing from my to read folder. So this would be something because I, well, I'm not sure about you, but I sometimes put papers in these folders and forget about them. Um, both of these works highlight the importance for supporting context in memory retriever. So contextualization is really key. And I think this is where we can have a lot of future work to have, for instance, such a paper recommender that is contextualized <laughs> to my current task that recommends me my store stored items. I think that would be cool to see some so see a system like that. Then there is another potential for future work um, in the context of attention. So we have seen that attention, so attention is really important, and attention is always something that we are lacking because we are overcrowded with information. So incorporating a user's current attention is really a crucial topic in the context of recommender systems from my perspective or from our perspective. And here the link between psychological models and theories of attention and, and machine learning models is, is completely underexplored. So this could, ha having a link between those two disciplines in this field could lead to more transparent, more explainable, models that um, help tailor recommendations to, to a user's current level of attention. So this would also be an interesting topic for future work. I think you, could you go on? Yeah, Marcus? sure. Yeah. Maybe the, yeah, can you hear me? Hmm? There's seemingly some, some lag there. Uh, yeah, we talked a lot about uh, how Personality can be integrated in uh, into um, yeah, into recommender systems into algorithms. Um, main things is I mean I I, uh, I elaborated that most of these algorithms most of these approaches are still relatively simple so to say, but at the more yeah the more higher level uh, so to say uh, we could say that it's still not overly well understood to which extent certain traits actually influence the perceived recommendation quality, so to say, of such personality enhanced recommender systems. There is actually a lot of variability that studies have shown between the relationship of personality and specific uh, recommendation performances. And there is also a lot of, uh, yeah, of insecurity, so to say, about the quality, of course, of such tools that automatically predict the personality of a user. I mean, often, sometimes um, it's not or kind of the way uh, the user perceives their personality is also different from how their peers or the family perceives them. So it's there are a lot of, of much harder problems, so to say. And of course, related to this, it could even be that in some cases, for some users, personality is completely irrelevant. So there is almost no uh, yeah, specific personalized connection between certain traits and certain preferences. So this is definitely something that we still need to work on and really gaining a deeper understanding on that. 
uh, a big other concern uh, that is related to all of this research that automatically predicts cross uh, personality from interactions of the users with system concerns privacy and ethical topics of course i mean you reveal a whole lot of information that and i think there has been a follow-up study also by the by uh, the team around kosinski that actually investigated uh the level of uh, of accuracy when predicting these different personality traits that an automatic system could uh could achieve versus if you ask uh well people in different circles around the user so to say so you ask their parents you ask their spouses you ask acquaintances and it was really frightening to see the the level of accuracy so i think their developed system could even predict some traits better than the girlfriend or the boyfriend of the person. So, well, after 10 years or so. Uh, so that's really, really interesting. But, uh, but of course, also poses some uh, serious ethical questions. Uh, and of course, um, yeah, already said, existing approaches are quite simplistic. So they either use or they extend some standard collaborative filtering fashion uh, by just adding uh, yeah, through some linear weighting uh, personality based similarity just as, as an additional factor. Um, so we need more, we need first a better understanding, I would say. We also need, based on that, some. Uh, yeah, more deeper consideration that is also reflected in algorithms, of course. So uh, just included this recent work that used uh, additional neural embeddings, so to say. So there is very few works that actually uh, yeah, integrate personality information into current well state of the art deep learning architectures, probably also because it's not overly simple, of course. So it's still a rather rather young area i would say and the last point is of course that uh well i already uh, mentioned this so very often the assumption is that we can in existing work that we can describe an item's personality uh basically through some other characteristics of a user interacting with an item so for instance uh, yeah, set reviews written by other users about the item. And of course, this might just serve as a very weak proxy. So the question of how, the very fundamental question, how we can accurately describe personality of an item or whether this makes sense at all to talk about personality of an item is still, uh, yeah, still needs a lot of attention and research, I would say. Nope. No, it's not sorry. It's frozen. No, okay. Uh, actually, uh, briefly summarizing it here for effective recommender systems. So again, similar to uh, to personality, our understanding about uh, to which extent the user's effective cues of mood or emotion really influences how we perceive uh, the quality of a recommender that uses such effective cues is still not well researched so typically just very simple uh yeah questionnaires are used in this case or that yeah make some some debatable assumptions again so really gaining a deeper understanding of that seems seems vital in my opinion uh another thing that is more specific to emotion and mood is their their highly dynamic nature so already by definition they are highly dynamic uh yeah <clears throat> emotion more than the mood, of course. Uh, so how and whether we should at all consider these changes of emotional responses during item consum uh, consumption or the change of a mood as uh, a result of a recommendation is still, still needs a lot of, of research. I think there was also one question, if I remember correctly by you young exactly yeah, this was exactly that kind of went exactly into this direction so can we differentiate between um yeah actually the 
the mood or the emotion that is currently experienced when consuming an item versus the, the emotion, the soon to be feeling, so to say, how you expressed it here. And of course, this also relates to kind of the question of how, uh, yeah, typically psychologists distinguish uh, emotions. So there is, it, it, it's really complex. I mean, uh, for instance, there are different kinds of emotions. There is, of course, the, the perceived emotion. So if you, that's the, the one most typically elicited, so to say, in most studies. You ask the user, how do you perceive this music piece? And then they say, okay, it makes me happy or something, or I perceive it as happy. That's the, that would be the right answer. But you can, of course, also be interested in trying to find out uh, emotions that are induced, so to say, by the item consumption. So by watching a movie, by looking at an image. And then we're talking about, uh, as I said, induced emotions. There are also emotions on the on the creator side. So which was, was the emotion that, for instance, uh, uh, a composer of a music piece wanted to transfer? Which are the emotions uh, that the, the pianist, or more general, the, the music performer wants to kind of uh, uh, show or communicate to their audience? So this is really a very, very complex problem, all of this. And then, in, in particular, here in, in computer science, and more specifically IR and recommender systems, we're making a lot of simplifications, of course. So thanks for this question. This is really this is a, a good one and still far away from being resolved. Uh, Marcus, we've only got four more minutes. So okay, we're up. almost done. Sorry, we're yeah. almost done. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, effective cues also sensitive information. So again, raising privacy and ethical concerns. And this is basically all of what I wanted to say about effective I recommend the system. I just tried to incorporate the answer to this question once, so we have more time later on. Mm -hmm. So evaluation, I think Liz, you wanted to spend. Yeah, more. exactly. So a few minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, so in most papers still use common evaluation method, standard performance metrics from IR or from machine learning. I mean, in the end, the question is really, so if we are designing our psychology informed recommender systems, what are the metrics that, that we will improve beyond accuracy? So it could even be that we do not improve in, in terms of accuracy, but maybe we improve in terms of transparency or algorithmic fairness or something, or maybe something new. And that would be interesting to study from my point of view and relevant to study. Because what value can such systems that are really incorporating psychological mechanisms, what value do they give to the user? I mean, there are many frameworks also that coming out, that are coming out. So there's a one by Yasha, um, how to set up like evaluations for in terms of fairness, for use and item fairness, and to design new metrics. So maybe frameworks like that could be a, could help to answer these questions. But yeah, we also need more research on the online performance of such psychology informed algorithms in order to really understand so what dimensions of user experience they influence. And what are they result in higher user satisfaction? So we in my in my group, so we have some insights that they really do result in higher um, conversion rates, but there's more research that is needed here. Could you go on? Thank you. Yeah. Designing user studies, so maybe last remark is really laborsome <laughs> and it's hard. Um to, to design great questionnaires is hard um, to draw meaningful conclusions, especially to design such studies so that they are ecologically valid. This can be really challenging so that we can draw meaningful conclusions. Also designing user studies is not, is it's challenging in the sense that we of course ask users for labor some work. So we do not want to overburden the users. Um, yeah, evaluation frameworks are always helpful. So um, yeah, but I think the, the most fundamental challenge is really that real world system access is missing for most people in academia and they are, yeah. So access to more real world systems would help of course in evaluation. Yeah, and finally, so we can end this tutorial with a vision. So our vision is 
for the future in recommender systems research is to draw from the dis disciplinary knowledge from other disciplines like psychology to create and evaluate recommender systems in order to achieve systems that are that consider extrinsic and ex intrinsic human factors and that the research around them generally adopts a user-centric perspective. And we hope that we see a lot of great work achieving this vision <laughs> from also this community. Yes, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. That was incredible. I'm sure everybody uh, agrees with me. That was a fantastic tutorial. I'm so sorry we've got to go now. But I'm sure people can catch up with you guys and um, get more insightful. Uh, sure, we're happy to answer Definitely. questions. Yeah. Thanks a whole lot. Thanks, Thanks for having us. It was it was such an honor to deliver a tutorial to this great community of Rexis. Yeah. Oh, well, we are all sorry for very limitations caused by not being as able to present there. Uh, we're yeah. really sorry for that. But, yeah. mm. Okay. See I hope you, you enjoy the conference. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm bye sure bye. you will. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.